Hey, podcast listeners. I'm Barbara Morgan, and you're listening to Austin Film Festival's On Story. This week on On Story, we're joined by screenwriting duo Mickey Daughtry and Tobias Iaconas. Mickey Daughtry is a screenwriter and young adult fiction author. She's best known for writing along with writing partner Tobias Iaconas, the films The Curse of La Llorona, Five Feet Apart, and Netflix Night Books. Tobias Iaconas also wrote 2009's Behind Enemy Lines, Columbia. In 2012, he partnered with Daughtry for an adaptation of the Jack Kilborn action horror novel, Afraid. Moderator Harrison Glazer sat down with the pair to discuss writing for horror at the Austin Film Festival. Clips of The Curse of La Llorona, courtesy of Warner Brothers Pictures. Clips of Five Feet Apart, courtesy of CBS Films. When did you guys each independently start writing and, and kind of what drew you to that, to that art form? I got a degree in theater in Georgia. So I was always kind of writing. I was more of like an like actor-director, but don't ask me to act or direct theater these days. So I, I just didn't have enough, quite enough control over the characters, even as a director. So I wanted to kind of, and I was always finding things that I think I would like to do this a little differently or that a little differently. And um, I mean, look, I was in junior high reading Greek plays, devouring them. So when you start there... I was reading of, comic books. They're the same. They're, they're the same. We've discussed this, that comic books are very much an archetypal storytelling just as Greek plays are. They're just more words than what I read. <laughs> Tobias, what about you? Uh, same thing. I rolled into L.A. Um, with a degree in English Lit. Took some screenwriting classes at UCLA. They have a great adult ed program, so night, night school. Um, so I took some, you know, basic screenplay formatting classes. The college I had gone to uh, didn't have any sort of film film classes, and um, got a job as an assistant at an entertainment company and joined a writing group, and that's where Mickey and I met. Do you guys remember, did you have a moment where you're like, I'm going to try to do this, I'm going to try to achieve this dream of, of writing? Was there a singular time? Yes, when I got the idea for Elsewhere, which was the script that was between, it was formerly known as Between, which got us to the Austin Film Festival and nearly won, and that idea like sat and sat and sat until I was like, I think I need to write it. And then my best friend, Ariel, who came to California with me, had um, found this writer's group because she was an actor and a singer uh, where we went to school. And so she wanted some like creative outlets and she found this writer's group where a lot of talented people were going. And she said, I think, I think you need to do this because that story you keep telling me, I think you need to get that out of you. And that is... When I went there, um, it was a click. I did a practice script <laughs> to see if I was we can do it, you know? Yeah. And then I could. And then I met Tobias, and that was like history. I'd always loved the movies and had been um, reasonably good at, at, at writing, you know, in school. But it, it didn't dawn on me. I, I didn't study the mechanics of movie making or I wasn't curious about the mechanics of movie making until late into college, and that's when I actually realized, oh, there's actually screenplays that these movies are based on, and maybe my you know, sort of young facility at writing is something I could do to get involved. And so I think it was, it was a very conscious, deliberate decision. Well, I just got to go to L.A. and try to make it work. Well, let's, let's talk about some of the films that I've seen, that some, some people have here seen, that, that have been produced. So uh, The Children, The Curse of La Llorona, which you guys wrote first... Um, where did that come from? Did, how did you guys come across that that myth or that story, and, and what we, kind of and what kind of ex, uh, research did you do on that story or on that mythology? All of it. There are like three thousand versions of it. Yeah. Every Latin American. Yeah, we did a lot. We did a lot. Yeah. And we can't. We we centered on the one, and with the new lines help. I mean, look, they were very much guiding the process the whole time. Like. Yeah, it was very important for us to do a deep deep dive on the mythology and all its variations, not just for accuracy, but for respect, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, La Llorona is a storied supernatural villain in, uh, in the Latin American culture, and we wanted to do her story and who she was justice. So we spent a lot of time not just doing book slash internet research, but actually talking to Went people. To and yeah. and met with them. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And then we, and then kind of as a group, or, you know, it was easily decided on the one that was the most... Um, prominent myth and the story that, that most people knew of her. Like, the variation then became how many kids did La Llorona really have and how many, you know, but we chose the most pervasive legend. So you're working on, um, maybe not mainstream, but on a horror film to go wide. So I, I imagine you're, you're, there are confines or, or mandates like you're working on 
did you draw from any specific sort of style or, or a specific horror film to, to build that frame? Well, we knew pretty early on they wanted to spin it into the Conjuring universe. Okay. So obviously there was a setting. There was, um, and if we, if Annabelle was going to be some of the supporting material, then we had a certain period that we were using. Um, so yeah, James Wan's movies, The Conjuring, yeah, Conjuring Two, the spinoffs. Pretty much there to, to, to try to match the style and the, and the flavor of of those movies, mm -hmm. but not, but also have its own thing. Like maybe it'll be a little lighter in the sense or a little, you know, mm -hmm. more tongue in cheek sometimes, but to definitely have the essence of, you know, a new line horror movie. When writing horror, how do you write scary? I think a lot of the horror that, that works a lot are, are concepts, like really interesting visual concepts. The one I'm thinking of for your movie is the, the clear umbrella. But so what's the process of, of writing scares, of actually writing specific moments that will scare the audience? And how do you guys do it together? We wrote some of them together. We didn't write some of them together. We wrote them and then Shavs, the, Mike, the director, came in. He put the clear umbrella in. Mm. You know, we had a backyard scene that we wrote mm. with this kind of like bush, you know, this really creepy kind of. And he was like, you know, it'd be really cool here, an umbrella, because it's in the 70s and you can see through it. So that was him, you know, so... A director comes in with the eye that says, this is great on paper and this is really scary, but when you're looking at it, this might be scarier. So it's a team, it's teamwork, really, mm -hmm. I'd say. But but for the script, we wrote our we wrote the scares individually and then would go in and adjust each other's work and to kind of heighten it or, you know, pace it, pace it a little differently. Most of it's about pacing, honestly. Um, I, I imagine there's there is a tough line when you're talking about horrible things happening to children yeah. in movies, yes. how do you find that line? Is that, did New Line help with that? We say, do we get to kill kids or not? <laughs> That's the line. Well, the, the answer and, is yes. And yeah. Walter said, you can kill the two at the beginning and the other two live. <laughs> so that's how it happened. Did you push it further at first? Were there any moments that were, they were like, whoa? No, no, no. We were we were a little timid, I'd say, yeah. about it, like out of the gate. Yeah. And then Walter's like, no, he's gonna break his arm. Mama, no! Go too far the first time if you can, because it's exactly much right. easier to pull back mm -hmm. than it is to add. Mm. Um, but yeah, you definitely, look, for something to be scary, you have to establish a real and present danger. And, uh, and for something to be scary, you have to care what happens to the characters. Right. <laughs> um, well, let's shift gears to cystic fibrosis, if that's let's okay. Do. Another scary monster. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, what's the seed with this one? Uh, where to see uh, Justin Baldoni. Mm -hmm. So he did a documentary called My Last Days. He's really fascinated with uh, people who live with terminal illnesses who have to push life and have to crunch life into such a short time when we give we get our whole lives to live it and somehow they live as much life or more than we do because we're taking our time, you know? Um, I don't want to speak for him, but, um, but, but he became friends with Claire Wineland, who is a real... C she was a real CF, CF advocate. She was a vlogger and uh, had a huge presence on YouTube and online. And um, she had cystic fibrosis, and they were friends. And if I'm remembering the story correctly, it was probably about a conversation of, you know, then you probably date within your community. And she said, no, that's the last person. We can't, we can't even be within six feet of each other. And he was like, oh. So he went to CBS. Um, and said, I have an idea, you know, as a producer and director, he wanted to um, direct a movie about um, two kids who fall in love at a hospital who have cystic fibrosis and can never touch each other. And that's what we got. That was our log line. Mm -hmm. So it was, and then he found our <clears throat> Elsewhere script uh, through a friend of ours, Mark Freiberger, who gave it to him. And then he read it and contacted us and was very persistent on getting us on board the project. 
because we, it's a hospital. It's, an, it's another kind of hospital movie and there's some, you know, um, a real elegance about like making a hospital a place where you live, not where you go. So he found that and he, <clears throat> you know, pursued us to write it and we came in, but, the, but what we got was a movie about this, you know, that line. And then, so we went away and we do what writers do, which is we came up with the best story that we could come up with based on that. And we came up with the story that you see, basically and came in and pitched that, and um, they liked it and hired us, and that movie was made in 18 months. It was, and it never happens like that. It was from getting hired to being at the premiere in 18 months. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's super fast. So as part of this, in, in, I guess, proving that you can do this, not only making the best story, but also thinking about Justin and thinking about what would appeal most to him and what, what would make him want to move forward? 100%, yeah. 100%. And also, what would, uh, you know, honor the cystic fibrosis yeah. community? I mean, we, that was always, you know, we actually met Claire uh, and fell in love with her, and, and we wanted to do something that was authentic, that was true. And cystic fibrosis is a very, um, is, is a disease, the, uh, the research into it is very charity-driven. There's not much government funding for it. So there's real need for awareness of the disease to drive, char- you know, to drive uh, charity-funded research. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to tell the most compelling story possible is the thing that would most honor uh, sufferers of cystic fibrosis because it would get into front of the most people. Um, and we also wanted to tell the story that hurt the most. Yeah. Yeah. That's just where I go every yeah. time. So what was that process of embedding yourself in that community and, and learning about uh, learning about it? Um, we talked to Claire a lot. Claire. I texted with her a lot. Um, mm-hmm. We She read all versions of the script until like the last, until it was pretty solid that we had the story that we were going with, and we had fixed the, one of the first, like, emails back was, where's the rep- respiratory therapist? And we're like, oh, we need to make, this nurse needs to have a different title. We had created her, but she wasn't, she didn't have the right title, wasn't doing quite the right things. And so Claire was very, very um, integral in getting everything right with concern to the disease itself. Yeah. And how much of Claire herself were you guys using when, when building these characters? Claire was one of the most perfectly whole people that I ever met. Like, she, she had her worked out. She knew who she was. Um, she didn't question her reason for being like we do many times as humans. And I think maybe with li- living with a terminal disease from a young age makes you hurry through that process, perhaps. I don't know. I don't have one. So I can't speak directly to that. But I know that when I was talking to her, and I do most of the character work, I think we've made that clear. And talking to her, I realized that, like, if we're going to tell a love story, and she had all the pieces inside her that would make for a perfect love story if they were in two different people. So I just separated her and made one Will and one Stella, and one has all of the rebellious traits and the wild I want to be free traits that Claire had. And one has the, I'm going to fight to live, I'm going to do what I need to do to stay alive and um, fulfill what I'm here for traits. So Will and Stella, if you put them together and make a perfectly whole person named Claire Wyland, that's how I did it. Let me guess, you're the kind of guy that ignores the rules because it makes you feel in control, am I right? You're not wrong. You think that's cute? Do you think it's cute? Letting your friends borrow your room for sex? is disgusting, so no. You don't like sex? No, I like sex. I like sex. Sex is fine. (laughs) Fine isn't exactly a ringing endorsement, but I'll take some common ground where I can get it. We have nothing in common. Ooh, that's cold. That's amazing. Did did Claire know that? Did did she see it? I don't know. No, she died uh, right, right as we were finished filming. She didn't get to see it, and I never told her that. She didn't know she was those both those characters. She probably did. I'm sure she saw it because a lot of what Stella does, like um, where she, would, I would, I would hang upside down on the bed and use my aflo vest like this, and you know, and the chocolate pudding was 100% her, and um, you know, a lot of their traits were her. I don't know that I ever breaking. said that, you know, because um, I don't know. Some people may not want to hear it, you know. Yeah, she inspired every line in that movie, of course. But it's not when you wouldn't say it's a true story. Mm-hmm. You were entering into a genre that isn't 
that has other things similar to it. What was uh, did you watch others like that, or were you worried about I've never having seen be- them? I watch all those love stories and all the teen movies, and this is really a genre that I really fit it in. I fit into pretty easily. Um, it was a pretty easily easy transition for me. Um, the horror in the, is more structure driven in the sense that Spice does that really well. So this was in, this was like putting on a pair of shoes for me. I was like, okay, let's see what's going on here. And um, I had seen Fault in Our Stars, and I knew we were going to get a lot of comparisons to that. I didn't care because mm-hmm. I knew that it wasn't Fault in Our Stars. It's not. It doesn't have the same tone. It doesn't have even the same kind of wit that John Green brings to something. It was. It's a completely different animal set with sick kids, so mm-hmm. it's considered sick lit. But I, I think pretty much a lot of people who saw it realized it wasn't yeah. quite the same. And the most fun I had when everybody was like, you know, who's going to die? And I was like, who is going to die? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, neither of them, because that is the strongest ending. You know, um, many times in these movies or stories or novels or whatever, you're expecting one of the kids to die. And I um, approached it with what is the most painful but most fulfilling outcome for both of these kids. And it's to know that you are walking away from someone who loves you and you can't be with them, but you love them enough to walk away. You know, people are always saying, if you love something, you have to learn to let it go. I thought that was such a <laughs> Until I watched you almost die. In that moment, Stella, nothing mattered to me. is to be with you. I can't. I need you to be safe from me. I write to the pain every time. I write to what hurts the most, what bleeds the most, you know. All of that was inspired by Claire. On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. This project is supported in part by the Cultural Arts Division of the City of Austin Economic Development Department, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services, Texas Library and Archives Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts, on the web at arts.gov. On Story is presented in part by Too Far Media. Provocative stories for the eyes, Ears and Imagination by Rich Shapiro. Download the Too Far Media app. Support for On Story comes from Bogle Family Vineyards, sixth generation farmers and third generation winemakers, creating sustainably grown wines that are a reflection of the Bogle family values since 1968. This show is produced by myself, Barbara Morgan. Our associate producers are Jamal Knox and Colin Heyer. Our editors are Jamal Knox and Travis Neely. Music is by Brian Ramos. Production assistance comes from Sound Lab Inc., Travis Kennedy Sound, and KUT 90.5 in Austin. Go to austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about Austin Film Festival and Conference each October. Until next time, I'm Barbara Morgan, and this has been Austin Film Festival's On Story.